As you said, I'm Jeremy Pollard. I'm from Box.com. And first off, I want to thank Colin and JR for so nicely teeing up this presentation that I'm going to give. Um, you really laid out a lot of the ideas and rationale behind the tool that I'm going to talk about today. And so I want to ask you, you all, um, what if your network was smarter than you? What if you had tooling in place to answer all the questions so that you didn't have to? So that you didn't have to actually look for the answers, it could tell you the answers. First, a little bit about me. Uh, as, I, as I said, my name is Jeremy Pollard. It's probably really hard to read. I'm a network engineer at Box.com. I am the SIGGRAPH 2015 uh, GraphicsNet Committee Chair. We help put on the, the ACM SIGGRAPH conference, run all the networking uh, to make the show run. I am an automation addict, um, kind of born and bred network engineer, but I'm quickly becoming more on the software engineering side. And when I'm not in front of a computer or in front of a network, I, am, uh, I travel the country uh, dancing to Lindy Hop and Blues. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, Box recently, over the past year and a half, two years, went through a complete network overhaul. Uh, our network had been growing organically over the, the years past, and it was very much a, well, if we, if we need a new switch, we add a new switch. It was a flat layer two design, and it just did not scale. I think we've all been in this kind of environment. Um, you start with a couple cabs, you add a couple more, eventually it becomes unmanageable. So we had the opportunity for a new network design to go completely greenfield, uh, new hardware, new design, uh, new data center space, everything from the cabinets to uh, the cap uh, structured infrastructure, uh, structured cabling, um, everything we got to rethink and, and look back on the design, design decisions of the past, all the mistakes of the past, and try and move forward with a, with a better design. So we wanted to build a smarter network. How did we do this? So in this talk, I'm going to talk about a a specific tool that I uh, started working on back in, in March. Uh, we started using it in April and we've been using it for the past several months. Um, but how do we go about building a smarter network? Well, we're network engineers and we like standards. We like specifications. We like designing with scalability in mind. And we like repeatable patterns. You know, we, we live and breathe by these things to, to make the internet operate, to make our networks run. Um, and when we are do, doing these network designs, these are things that we, we hold really near and dear to our hearts and, and ideas that we, we like to embrace. And yet, with all of this effort that we put into these new designs, uh, we're stuck answering these questions. Which IP address should I use? Where is this host located? How am I supposed to cable this device? What ports should I plug into? Um, and did you configure that new switch? Is that taken care of? Is it in DNS? All these questions are boring. <laughs> <laughs> They're error prone. Every single time a human has to answer one of these questions, you could screw up royally. Um, they're a waste of time. And with these errors and these wastes of time, uh, it's, it ultimately costs the company money. So how did Box approach this? Well, a little bit of background on our new network architecture, 30 seconds or less. Uh, we went with a core aggregation top of rack model design as opposed to leaf and spine or, or something like that. Uh, we are fully routed to the top of rack. Uh, so layer two domains are isolated within the cabinet itself. Each, uh, each cabinet gets two, two Tor switches. It's very pattern based mathematically generated IP addresses, host names, VLANs, everything has a formula. We've assigned ID numbers to every aspect of the network, be it the data center, the pod, the cabinet, the rack U. Um, I'll get more into this later, so you don't need to worry too much about it right now. So for every pair of top of racks, we have over 300 pieces of unique information that need to go into these configs. This is your IP address subnets, your pinned routes, uh, all the network statements, all of the radius logging NTP servers, um, interface descriptions, all these little bits of information that if you were to diff your two configs side by side, that would show up. Um, 
there's about 180 DNS records. We like subnets. We have a lot of them. We want them all to show up in trace routes uh, correctly. And then there's just the cabling instructions. We've got eight upstream port assignments, two serial consoles, two management ports. Um, all these things add up and they make for a highly complex network. But also a very highly automatable one. So it's time to start building a smarter network. Enter the infrastructure to API. Not a very creative name, but a very helpful tool. This is what I started working on back in March, and uh, we started using it in production in, I want to say, April or May, and been, have been using it every day since. Uh, what it is, is an HTTP-based REST API. Uh, it manages all things IP, network, and data center related. It acts as a single source of truth for our network infrastructure. Uh, it's our design specification, that thing that we spent so much time developing before rolling out this new architecture, but it's implemented into code. So what does it do specifically? Well, it manages the IP addresses for all aspects of the network, both networking devices as well as uh, host deployments, both the in-band and the out-of-band management side. It does host name generation, all of the DNS registration generates all those 300 bits of unique information for our top of racks. It does host to security zone mapping and can provide physical and physical location information about any given IP address as well as, you know, just what's my gateway. Um, it returns JSON objects, which means it can be easily integrated into other applications. You don't have to worry about what language they were written in or what language I wrote mine in. Uh, the API is actually written in PHP. A lot of people don't like PHP. A lot of people don't like Python. Flexibility when you're using something like REST. And um, the way it returns these objects, it works very nicely integrating with uh, my very first hackathon project at Box, which was a token-based templating system for you know, my first pass at standardizing our templates, our configuration templates, so that we can feed in these individual bits of information, get the full text config, and also get human readable cabling instructions. So how does it work? Well, fundamentals first. Everything's procedurally generated. As I said, we've got IDs for everything, we've got um, formulas for everything, and so given a single seed, we can calculate every bit of information, every aspect of a switch that goes into our, into our production network. So remember the IDs I mentioned? We have them for data center, pods, cabinets, host types on uh, the production side and rack use on the out of band management side. And all of these pack very nicely into IP addresses. Uh, before anyone asks, these are not the actual bit field lengths, it's just a pretty graph. Um, so it's a little hard to read, but we've got a static block in front followed by the data center, the pod, the cab, the type, and then eventually the host. By doing this, we can take an IP address and derive all of these, all this ID information uh, specifically just out of the IP. Once we have the IDs, we can derive everything else. So this is where things get really complicated, but I'm gonna give you a few small examples. Uh, we have a notion of cab count, and cab count is the product of the maximum pod size times the pod ID minus one plus the cab ID. And that's about as easy as it gets. Host name is a concatenation of TSW, the name for, for top of racks, uh, and the cab count, also pretty straightforward. If you wanna know this, the terminal server number that this switch will connect up to, it's cab count divided by 32 time, or plus seven times the pod ID minus one plus four. And if you wanna know the port, the serial port to use, 33 plus cab count minus one mod 32 divided by two. It gets really, really complex, really, really fast. Um, but all of these equations, all of these formulas, are ones that you've already done, already thought about, just not in this way. You already know, okay, I've got an ag switch. An ag switch has 48 ports. Each top of rack needs two ports on that ag switch. And you can just do the math from there. All this is doing is making a representation of how do I find the exact port for this exact switch. So all of this design information is stuff that you've already done, it's just thinking about it from a slightly different angle. Um, 
and so on. We have pages of these, of these formulas and equations that build up our entire network. So the use case and what we're actually using this for and doing on a daily basis is switch provision. We've put up, you know, tons of new switches with this, uh, with this tool and uh, it's, it's one of our just, you know, run the business operational uh, jobs that we have to do. So how it starts is in the data center, the DC tech enters in the physical, um, the, the physical information for the cabinet that they're gonna provision. This is a little hard to see. But on the side we've got, you know, DC one, cage one, cabinet 12. And they hit go. This is, this is actually uh, that templating system that I made for my first hackathon at Vox. Um, th that goes through, gets crunched through the infrastructure API, gets tokenized through uh, this template for cabling instructions. And you see that in a cabinet, we have three devices, two out of band, or two top of rack, one out of band, the U locations, cross connect information, Z side device, Z side port, A side port, um, all mapped out, generated on the fly. Uh, so once the DC tech gets this information, they can go through, build up the cabinet, and pass it off to NetOps. Once racking is complete, uh, unfortunately right now, we're still manually configuring the management IP address. Um, with all the talk of zero touch provisioning, and automated configuration deployment and all this stuff. Uh, generating the config is supposed to be the hard part and DHCP is supposed to be the easy part. We kind of got them backwards. I've got the config down, it's the DHCP stuff that we're still working on. So we're getting there. But this management IP address will be our seed. This is what we will use to generate every aspect of the switch as we provision it in, into production. Um, so our workflow is once, once the address is configured, we download a provision.sh, which is a small script. In our new network design, uh, our top of racks are Aristas, which means that we can download scripts, run them, lo run local code on box. Um, so we download the script, run it, it downloads the latest version of EOS that we want to use, uh, it detects the management IP address, and then it makes an API call out to our infrastructure API, feeding in that management address as a as, as the only argument. Infrastructure on API on the back end receives that in, extracts out all those IDs that I talked about, and from that generates the entire <coughs> config, all of those 300 options, passes that through our templating system, and then back to the script, uh, which gets saved as our startup config. Um, second call is to our registered DNS endpoint. Same thing, passes in the management IP address pulls out those IDs, generates all of the DNS records that need to be created for this switch, and uh, registers them through our DNS API, um, and we don't have to touch any of it, and we know they're all correct. Uh, lastly, it downloads a first boot.sh, which will run when the, when the switch reboots, and it reboots the device. After reboot is complete, uh, we're using Arista's, I think it's the AEM, uh, or advanced event manager, something like that, uh, to execute this first boot script two minutes after boot up. Uh, it calls out to a third API, which um, is kind of our inventory management system, and when that executes, the API does a scan of the device, pulls out host names, serial number, interface states, IP addresses, all that information and populates it into our inventory kind of control database. Um, and once it's in there, success. The switch has been successfully provisioned. It will be automatically added into uh, monitoring and other, um, you know, other types of, of polling tools, Rancid, et cetera. Yeah. I have several questions. So what do you think your device is not a risk of the one support this it is it is 1918 address space. Um, if you're if you're not using Arista, I know Cisco has some offerings that uh, let you run code locally on on Box. Uh, Cumulus, obviously, you can run local code on Box. Uh, there are there are more and more that will allow this. Um, vendors, it, it does take vendor support. We'll, we'll move on, we'll, we can talk in one of the breakout sessions. 
Um, so other uses. You know, this is, this is how we as NetOps use this tool. But once you make something like this uh, and people catch wind, there's a lot more you can do with it. So our core data center teams use this API for all host provisioning, for determining IP addresses, getting the, uh, the host name, registering it in DNS, dealing with the management IP addresses, uh, setting up DHCP reservations, uh, all of that kind of stuff all happens through this API. Our data center teams use it to, you know, troubleshoot, um, locate hosts within a network, and uh, just kind of, it, it is the source of truth. And everything kind of circles back to it. Uh, Hadoop uses it for rack awareness. I'm not a Hadoop guy, but I know this has something to do with fault tolerance and zoning and that kind of stuff. Um, and they needed a way to determine which rack am I in so that I can pair with other devices in that rack. We handed off this API and they just pass in the IP address and from that they can get full rack information. Um, and it also assists in kind of automating base level audits and finding, you know, red herrings, sending up red flags. If the inventory system says a server is in one rack but the IP address doesn't map to that rack, you know something's wrong, it'd be very easy to set up uh, a red flag. Basically, if you build a tool like this and expose it to the rest of operations, people will use it. They'll find uses, use cases for it. Um, that's the beauty of, of writing something as an API and not just a command line script that can't be consumed by anyone else. So, with all this automation, humans are still needed. Like, we're not out of jobs, right? You bet. Uh, all those IDs have to be defined. Our job just gets easier. Um, we've decided on a, on a YAML based uh, data structure um, to store all this stuff as opposed to database back. This way we can store it in Git, we can version control it. Uh, it's, it's just an association of, you know, a data center has an IT, has an ID. Uh, data centers are assigned pods. Pods have IDs. Pods exist in cages. Uh, pods are assigned cabinets, cabinets have IDs, and it's just a, a kind of a relational mapping bringing all these things together so that when you look for these ID numbers or, or refer to things by their canonical names like what is the cabinet name, not the cabinet ID number, so you can map through all of, all of this information. Um, and so a human still needs to set this up. You still have to do the allocation. But this is the extent of the network configuration that we do for new top of rack provisioning. We add a cab, put in its name, give it an ID number. It's one line and we've generated all the, I, all the, the configs for those devices, the cabling instructions and the, the DNS entries as well as a wealth of other information for other teams to use. Um, and the bottom line is we're not just answering these questions anymore. If you asked me any of these, the answer would be I don't know. I have no idea what IP address you should use. You need to ask the tool. Our networks are getting to the point where they're complex enough that we can't be expected to answer these questions because it's just a waste of time. We can write tooling around it and then we can get on to the more interesting problems. So, yeah, there we go. Uh, this also is great. What are the drawbacks? What have we run into? What are the problems? Well, you can screw up your ID allocation. You meant to make this cab ID one, but you made it at ID two. Um, in our case, I mean, this all comes down to your business and how you run your network. We don't care. If we have 10 cabs in a row and they get all allocated kind of, you know, one, five, seven, three, whatever, it doesn't matter to us. It all routes, it all works. We can deploy our hosts in any of the cabinets, so that's a non-issue. Uh, the data center tech could cable something wrong. There could be something wrong at, at the physical layer. We've all experienced this. Um, and during the provisioning process, either it just won't work or it'll download a completely valid but incorrect config and register completely valid but incorrect DNS records. Uh, the DNS records are still necessary because they're just going to be for the other switch and so you don't have to do any cleanup there. Um, and once the switch reboots with this valid but incorrect config, none of your adjacencies will come up. So that's a pretty easy way to identify, oh, something went wrong, let's go back and fix it. So it fails fast and we can fix forward very quickly. Um, 
if you need to move an existing cab to another pod, all we have to do is change that YAML file, change the ID around, move it to an, move that cab name to another pod, and then tell the data center team to reprovision this cabinet as net new. Um, and bugs. Lots of bugs. It's a very complex system. We've got a lot of formulas. But the, the domain and range of it is pretty well defined, pretty limited. You can write test cases around this. Where are the problems going to be? It's probably going to be as you're wrapping around devices, as you're at needing to add in a new aggregation layer or a new serial server. Um, that's where most of the bugs lie. And you know where those edges are. You can write test cases around them. Test cases are the most important part of this. If you do not have test cases, none of this will work. You will fail and you're just going to have a bad day. So test cases are good. Uh, they also really help with refactoring. As I've learned about software development, um, the first time I had to do a major refactor and had all those test cases in place and I ran them and they worked, I didn't trust them, but <laughs> it was reassuring. <laughs> So, what's next? My immediate plans for this tool, um, obviously get DHCP working, that will completely remove NetOps from the provisioning pipeline of these new, new topper racks. Um, we have cable maps that are generated dynamically. Feed these into GraphViz, D3, any tool of your choice, um, and you can have dynamically generated topology diagrams that you can pass off to auditors, um, troubleshooting, you can make dashboards out of them, show which links are up and down completely on the fly. And I want to do, I want to tie it into another tool that I've written for uh, kind of device management, configuration management, so that we can do automated link validation. We just stood up the switch, but is the fiber clean? Are the light levels good? What's the DB loss? Is, is there errors on the interface? That kind of stuff. Uh, I want to be able to get to a point where, we're, where we are pre-flighting these switches in a completely automated fashion. We plug them in, turn them on, and then eventually we see a green light that says this switch is ready for production. So this is a tool that we are using, completely developed in-house. Uh, we're using it in production today. We've been using it since about April, and it has made our life significantly easier. So I'm not saying this is the right way to do it, but think about these things. Think about where you can start implementing these types of tools in your business, in your framework, um, and you'll stop answering those silly questions. So, thank you.